Hello, I'm Malcolm Hazlitt. Sometimes I'm amazed at the people I've chatted with on this program, and this next family is one of the most interesting. Stay with us for the next half hour and be inspired. Hello and welcome to our time. We have a very special family, but before we meet the family on this episode, I'd like to introduce to you Susan Knapp, who's mum in the family. Yes, indeed. But Susan is also the Chief Engagement Officer and founder of Into Ed Africa, Into Ed meaning education. Into education. Right. In Africa. In Africa. Mm -hmm. But we're here in South Australia at the moment. We are. So for now. Susan, for now, okay. <laughs> So sometime in your life a while ago, you thought, I've got to go out and see the world. Is that what happened? It, yes, sort of. I finished university here in Adelaide and literally as soon as I finished, I, an opportunity came for me to go to Kenya and I'd always wanted to go to Kenya. It was an Adelaide-based teenage exchange program, which I was oh, right. going over as a supervisor. How brilliant. And sort of never came back. <laughs> See, we really don't know a great deal about, well, Kenya or Africa generally, I suppose. Mm -hmm. It only dawns on people that Egypt's part of Africa. We were just saying True. that before. Mm. Sometimes we forget what big continent it is, like Australia. There's a lot of things happening here, but they're all different in different places. Yeah, absolutely. And where we live in Nairobi, big parts of it are very modern. Right. Especially nowadays. A lot more modern than some parts of Australia. And that's the other interesting thing, because mm. we think of Africa as still a third world country, and it isn't, of course. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's now reasons. I think it's um, an emerging economy mm. where there, there is a, technology has brought in a really big middle class in Kenya and across Africa, but there's still a lot of poverty there. Because of the number of people that live there, do you think, or is it just, I mean, that sounds like a dumb question to ask, but... Um, is poverty generated because there's just not enough to go around or is it education? Um, if I look at from my time sort of pre-internet, mm. if, if I'm going to go back that, that old. Well, we all um, can. Yes, we can. Pre-internet to post-internet, um, quite often people who live in resource poor communities are very, very resourceful. And so when the internet came in and when the internet came into Kenya, uh, it actually opened up enormous amounts of resourcefulness for people, and I believe that was part of the generation of the new middle class. Right. Yes. That makes so, perfect sense. Yeah, lots of people. It's a renaissance, isn't it? Absolutely. It's like people learning to read exactly. and being un able to understand why things are the way they are, and the internet's done that for everybody. Absolutely. And mm. African governments make internet connectivity really cheap. Uh, it can be on public buses, in bus stops, all over right. where it's free. Right. So it means. Is this mostly generated? or used through phones or? It is. Yeah. Yes. Predominantly. So um, the cost of mobile phones became really cheap and people can run businesses through their phones. Yes. Sell products through their phones. It is amazing. It is yeah. amazing. It's really created a huge revolution. Do you think you lived another life and you came from that place in a previous life? <laughs> <laughs> so actually it, it's quite unusual because for somebody who I consider who grew up quite um, the norm in, in mm. Adelaide, in a nuclear family, in a middle-class suburb, going to a, a regular school to sort of have this enormous international experience. It, I couldn't quite understand it. And when I came back, as part of my healing, I actually went for a past life healing. Oh, did you? And I'd never done anything like this before. Okay. And I was lying on the table up at Woodside and the first thing the lady said to me was, I can see that you were a female ruler of an African tribe. Oh, <laughs> you weren't Cleopatra because that's popular. Yeah, no, I wasn't Cleopatra. And it was interesting because she then connected into the fact that the people that I had been ruling in this past life uh, had all been murdered under my rule. Oh, okay. And I'd just come out of living this life in Rwanda. Right. So in addition to living in Kenya, most recently I lived in Rwanda and I was the principal of a big international school, predominantly Rwandese teachers and children. So people who had genocide in their history of this lifetime. Oh, interesting. 
And so then it's connected into, I think, why we created Intuit Africa and why we now do to heal some of those past life things. Okay. <laughs> I hadn't talked to you before, but how interesting did that come? Well, I know. And it was so bizarre because I'd never been into anything like that. I was just mm. sort of searching for an answer to this very left of centre life that I had lived considering my upbringing. How interesting. But so you met somebody over there. Met many people. Yes, but somebody <laughs> you married over there. I did. So we, I'd always wanted to adopt an African baby girl. Mm -hmm. And in 1997, that happened. And I adopted my first child, who at the time was two months old. Mm -hmm. And the man who I adopted her with, we were told that our adoption would get passed through court more easily if we were married. Right. So it was kind of a shotgun marriage, okay. but, but it was an adopted baby. Yes. Yes. See, I'm adopted and I feel such a need for more adoption to occur. Absolutely. Because there's an awful lot of children out there looking for parents and there's an awful lot of parents out there looking for children. Absolutely. It's and very difficult in this country to adopt. It is. And, you know, with our adoption, we, we were very fortunate for it to have been quite a, an easy process because I was living in Kenya for my first child adoption and living in Qatar for the second one, who I also adopted from Kenya. Right. And so many people through my life have said, oh, you know, these children are so lucky that, that they were adopted by you. And actually, it's the complete opposite. <laughs> they have brought us so many gifts, so much joy. Um, you learn the essence of unconditional love. Mm. And that's an enormous gift. Mm. Mm. I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. So... You're, it's really hard to know where to start with your story. We're going to meet three of your children yes. in a little while. But yes. Take us through the next movement of your life because this is a fascinating story. <laughs> so from I spent 10 years living in Kenya and when my daughter, my firstborn, my, my adopted daughter was two, Think there was a bit of political turbulence in Kenya, so we decided to come back to Australia. Mm -hmm. And this was in the end of 1999, came back to Adelaide and I just couldn't handle it. I had led this great lifestyle that was full of vibrancy and, and beauty abroad and I found this a little bit too mundane for my liking. So I lasted almost two years and then I moved to Malaysia. So I've worked as a teacher most of my career right. and got a teaching job on the east coast of Malaysia. Right. From there, after three years there, I moved to Qatar in the Middle East and spent 10 years living and working in Qatar. <laughs> it's the heat in Qatar that really knocks you about. How did you manage with that? The heat is... Don't go outside. ...insane. <laughs> we actually learnt to, to live our life around the heat because the heat is predominantly July, August and September. Mm. So December is great. Um, and so in July, August, September, British schools have holidays. So the, most of the country is closed and people tend to leave. Uh, we often didn't leave. We would stay indoors during the day and then we would go out at night. Swimming pools have chillers. Yes. So I where know. we have heaters, I they know. have chillers. It's crazy. Yeah. The yeah. water's too hot to swim in. The water is too hot to swim in. But <laughs> we, we love the place. Mm. Yeah, we love the place and a lot of gratitude. So did you go back to Africa again? So after um, Qatar, yes, I then moved to Rwanda, Central Africa. And after Rwanda, moved to Malaysia again, this time to Kuala Lumpur. Mm -hmm. And then three years ago... Crash landed back in Adelaide. Before the big COVID issues? Yes. Yes. Well, that was lucky. Yes. I was a little bit before it because... Oh, yes. Yeah, we came back at the end of... At the beginning of 2019. Yeah, before yeah. all that happened in 20. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just going through your life and with your children... At, how have your children coped with sort of moving around this amount? What has it meant to them, do you think? I'll ask them that in a minute, but what has it meant to you, meant to them? Well, they actually haven't moved around as much as I have. Uh, my two oldest ones actually considered Qatar to be their home. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah because that that's sense. where they grew up. Yeah. And then my two youngest ones were both born in Qatar. Right. And so that is their fam that is So yeah, so they Qatarians. really Qatarians. That's what that's what they actually say. Yes. They say that they are Qatari and that's where they're born. Uh, but their whole life they've always spent a lot of time in and out of Kenya because that's what I do and, and where I love, but it's also a huge part of their identity. Mm. So being able to to give them the gift of their own culture and their family in Kenya as well was also really important how, to me. Yeah, well, how important is that, their own culture? To me, it was really important. And when I was making the decision to adopt, I made the conscious decision that that was how I was choosing to parent. But I also knew I could only, I, I really believed that I owed the culture to the children I was adopting. Mm. I wasn't adopting children to predominantly bring them in and, and raise them with my values and my beliefs. It was about embracing their culture, which is why I chose to adopt Kenyan children. Right. Because I know so much about it. The whole world is sort of slowly moving towards almost a universal culture in a lot sure. of areas. yes. Do you feel that that sort of happened within the family? I do. A bit do. of this, a bit of that, now it's a whole round... I'll ask the kids that in a minute. Yeah, and well, and it'll be interesting to hear what they say because mm. for them the way Stop they are listening. is, is Stop listening. <laughs> for them the way they are is just that's all they know. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, yes, so it's just course. all they know, and you know to have friends all over the world, to be raised in um, Islamic countries, yep. um, just just to embrace humanity, and it's where you realise that all humans are just humans. Absolutely, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Quite interesting. Yeah. Well, we're going to be back to talk with three of Susan's children in just a moment. Oh, so many questions. I'm looking forward to this part. <laughs> and we're back with Susan and her whole family. Susan, introduce the kids to us, please. Yes, good idea. So, Malcolm, this is Marley. Oh, Marley, Marley is Hello. 11 years Mr. old. Mr. 99% Marley. <laughs> He's Where's the other 1%? The 1% <laughs> is the average. The 99% is because Marley does what 99% of 11-year-olds don't do. Right, don't do. Don't okay, we've do. got to investigate that thoroughly. You shall. This is Amalia. Amalia is seven years old. Mm -hmm. And this is Aaliyah. And Aaliyah is 17. <laughs> 17. <laughs> 17. So, kids, you've lived all over the world uh, and you've experienced lots of different cultures. What's that meant to you? Um, it's been really cool because we were able to be exposed to that level of community that we normally wouldn't get if we were stuck in one country. That's so true. And it has opened our eyes a bit to seeing the different cultures that we yeah, have seen and we made so many different friends and experimented with like But when food. you're moving around a lot, you sort of lose track of your friends. How's that happened? Uh, what's happened in that? Have you just lost people along the way? Not really. Like you lose people for that uh, period of time and then you'll find them again through social media or something. Yes. Yeah. That's the amazing thing then, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Because you, you're not... And you've got so many places in the world to go. Yeah. When you want a holiday. That's true. I think really. it's fantastic. Yes. Uh, so what... You're, you're all doing something special. So as I'm talking to you now, what's your special? Uh, so my um, special thing that I do is for our community in Kenya, uh, we built two schools. Mm -hmm. And within that, we have a dance troupe. And I actually help eradicate period poverty from our community in and Kenya. See, and you see, that's something that people don't think about. And in our society, we don't want to talk about that. Yeah, but it's a reality for half the population of the world. Mm -hmm. Yes. And if you're in a situation you don't have what you need, so how are you doing that? Um, I'm doing that by making and giving out sustainable sanitary packs. So they are made and given out in Kenya. I employ two ladies to do the sewing over there. And right. Yeah, and since the beginning of this year that I've started my project, right. I have made 720 packs. How so that's sure. 720 girls that can now stay in school um, yeah. during that time. That is amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Does that make you feel like you're giving back? Yeah, it does. Yeah, because with your mum taking you uh, when you were so young, um, 
and giving you a life that you would probably never have expected. Yeah, so... Had you not met. Yeah, because if... And oh. I, I've said before, I'm adopted too. So what does that mean to you? How, how do you feel in regards to your mum and society generally being an adopted child? Well, I think it's pretty cool, but it also gives me a reason to help the girls in Kenya yeah. because I was born in the community there. And as you said, if mum hasn't adopted me, um, my life would have been really different. You probably would have stayed in that community. Yeah, and, seen the and world. experience what they're experiencing now. So knowing that because I've got the possibility to get what I need from here, mm -hmm. I can provide them with what they need over there. Do you have a long term ambition? Eradicate period poverty from all of Kenya. Okay. <laughs> and the world. And expand it. And the world. <laughs> and the world. I like that. Now, Marley, 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 Mr. 99% Different, you've got a podcast. <laughs> yes, I have my own podcast called 99 Seconds with Marley. And in 99 Seconds, the person talks about my three hashtags, which is 99% kindness, 99% gratitude, and 99% courage. So what made you do that? I thought of the hashtags kindness, gratitude and courage mm. because I live the opposite of kindness, gratitude and courage. Because you live the opposite of that? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well... How would you explain that, Mum? Um, so Marley had gone through some experiences where he had been unappreciated, mm. where people had been mean to him. Because of what? Just life. Oh, just life generally. Yeah, just the it's right hard people. hard being a kid. <laughs> yeah. But it and, is. and sometimes it's the adults that are, that are not being as mature as they should be. So Marley, Marley and I ended up becoming separated when he was five years old. Yes, that's a bit scary, isn't it? Yeah, so I, was, I got stuck in the Middle East and at five years old, Aaliyah was ten. I put them on a plane to Australia and didn't live with them again for three years. I know, that's an extraordinary part of your story. Did you become mum? No, no. Our, my older one, Tashania, oh, older one. became mum. Who's now in Melbourne. So she's in Melbourne, so she became mum. Tell her the show's on, because this plays in Melbourne as well. I will, mm. I will. And so Marley had lived that, and so because he had those feelings as his lived experience, yeah. and then discovered that he wasn't alone, lots of children, have these experiences. Yeah, I think, yeah, I remember having, yeah, it's just finding where you fit in the world, but it's not necessarily the people that don't have that warmth towards you, don't really fit with them. Yeah, yeah. that's it. And so yeah. he decided that by creating 99% kindness, 99% gratitude and 99% courage, he could actually spread that energy out into the world. Okay, now she said that, can you say all that again? <laughs> <laughs> And you're the dress designer. Yep. And we've got some of your garments here. I don't think this will fit me. Oops. Mm -hmm. I'll do it the right way, Rick. Come over here and hold it up. Be a model. She is a model Just as well. Just pop that on. Just mind your microphone there. Like this. And this piece goes, what, up Behind. there? <laughs> no, wrong. This piece goes where? It goes um, at the back and then ties around my waist. Right. Sorry, can I do this for you? Oops, you hold that up. Exactly so like there. that. What a smart outfit. I don't know that I can tie a bow quick enough to be... Um, oh, 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 nearly. There you go. Is that the look? Yep. So that's one look, or it can be worn as a cape. Yep. Yes. So same dress, it can and be, be worn super as girl. a cape. Yep, exactly. Yep. <laughs> Pretty smart. Yeah. And does it come in many colours? I have it at the moment in purple and this pink and I have it in like a darker purple okay. with some blue and then purple, black and green and a bit of blue. Right, so you designed all this? Yes. But you didn't sew, sew it, it all together. No. You've got somebody to help with that. <laughs> well, you can't do everything in life, can you? Mm. I, and what happens to these garments? Obviously people can buy them. What happens to the I've money? I've only sold one. Okay. And so what are you planning to do with the money when you sell more? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe save up to buy a pony? <laughs> a pony? It'd be so easy to get a pony on the plane back to Qatar or wherever. 
But what do you do with your profits, Amalia? What did you yeah. buy with your first set of profits? Oh, sweet, oh. Let me undo that. Oh. Yep. I've Don't got it all that. now. Thank you very much. What did you buy? Well, we started off by buying a sewing machine in Kenya that Aaliyah now uses for her sanitary projects. Isn't that good? Exactly. I love what you give, you can go and sit down again. Yeah. I, I love what you've given the kids. Thank um, you. Because it's something that a lot of parents don't have the opportunity to give to a child, to open up the world to them. Yeah. Was that what you wanted to do or has it just been accidental? You know, when I came back to Adelaide, I started working in a classroom here and I just was really quite shocked at my perception of how broken many children are. Mm. And it doesn't mean that they've come from a low socioeconomic background. There's something about the way that we're raising children which isn't actually nourishing their souls. Do you think it's we're too locked into social media and with parents, all parents working, um, they're not getting enough time with their kids to enjoy their kids? I, I think that's a part of it, but I also think we've created a culture of raising children who are entitled. Oh, absolutely. And I think we've, and I think we have to own that as adults mm. because that's what I believe we've created. But at the same time, we've tried to give the kids things that we didn't have. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. But I think now I drive everything. I can't think of what I didn't have. Well, to be and honest. and that's that's actually what it comes down to. What do they actually need? Mm. And that's what we learnt. You know, there's a lot of um, mental health issues here with children, high levels of anxiety and depression. Um, that I have never seen in my entire teaching career until I got back to Australia. Mm. So I really decided that my children needed to be uh, able to activate their own purpose and that was why we created the schools in Kenya. Right. Now you're homeschooling these two yeah. but you're going to a school, Nazareth, here, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. How's it been fitting in with everybody there? Because you've obviously seen an awful lot more than most of the students that you're at school with. Uh, yeah, but I think it's fine. It's different from the other schools I've been to, but yeah, I don't think... I well, don't... what I meant by that question, once you've travelled around the world as much as you have, you know a lot more about other cultures, other countries, um, other climates. You know, you've lived in completely opposite climates to most people here. Um, how do you think you react to the other kids particularly if they start whinging and moaning about things, conditions, do you say, <laughs> when I was in Qatar, it was 45 degrees. Yeah, sometimes it's kind of weird because of the things they complain about. They're, yeah. like, not really, uh, like, problems that you need to complain about. There was a time where I've heard kids complain that didn't have internet for, like, a couple of hours, <gasps> and I was like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's the main thing to complain about. Yeah. It's a very nice thing. It's a does that bother you? Yeah, that bothers. Yeah, it does, yes. <laughs> See, lot. you're the new generation that can't do without the technology. Marley, are you? <laughs> now, hang on. I know about you and your wheels that you're constantly buzzing around. Yeah, on it, my scooter. What do you call it? Is your scooter? Yeah. Yeah. And I believe you're brilliant. Yeah, I do a lot of practice. C could make that into a career? Yeah. You reckon? So Marley's up to almost, I think, about 7,000 followers on Instagram. How amazing. <laughs> and he does his scooter riding. So the idea was that the kids would actually um, be able to monetize what they already love. Yeah. And then pay it forward. And give it back. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So he, he does exactly that by spreading his kindness, gratitude and courage. And it seems to be really resonating with people. Well, here's a quick answer. What do you feel you're going to do in your future life? Me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to continue with this project because uh, it's not there's not really an end to it. And it's something that I know that I'm giving back to the community. And it's something that, because I like helping people, yeah. it's something that I would like to do for a long run. Where do you want to live in the world, do you think? Oh, that's a good question. If you have a choice. Um, I'm going to ask you all the same questions. <laughs> People um, always ask us that question. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Originally, I wanted to live in, like, Japan, but now I'm rethinking that because... Have you been to Japan? I was meant to go. Oh, okay. And then COVID got oh, in the okay, way yes. for a school trip, that, and yeah. then, yeah, I didn't get to go. Was there a reason for Japan, though? 
Oh, just because of this, like, the culture and the stuff. Okay. I, and it's a country I've never been to. So. Okay. What about you? What do you think you're going to do when you're older? I am going to buy a farm and get as many horses as I can. You love horses? Why do you think that is? Well, it's just very fun to, like, you know, get through all the riding and everything. Okay. And... What, <laughs> what interested you in that, though? Did you see horses that you fell in love with? Yeah, I got a horse. Uh, Coco. Mm -hmm. uh, she's pretty old though, but she's a good horse for me. <laughs> How old is she? Mm. Not twice as old as you. She's about 36. Oh, okay. More than twice as old as you. <laughs> Marley, what do you think I about what you'll do in the future? Yeah, I would live here, but I'd travel a lot. Okay. Yep. Is that your answer too, Mum? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> no, I've learnt to make home wherever I am yeah. at that moment yeah. and try With to the do kids. the same for the kids. Yep, yeah. yep. So try to do the same for the kids. And No, but home is where your family is. Home is where your family yeah. is. Um, I, you know, my heart is always in Kenya and the developments that we're running in Kenya and our projects. So it, it would just be great to Well, we haven't us. really talked much about the projects in Kenya. Because so we've talked about so many other things. Uh, well, <laughs> Um, and we're getting the wind up now, so we're going to be back in a moment and we'll answer that question. We're back with the Knapp family and we just asked a question before the break. What are you doing in, in I nearly said India, what are you doing in Africa? What we're doing in Africa in, in a nutshell is in 2019 the children and I went to Kenya and built two schools. And so we now run educational developments on the ground in Kenya. Via the internet? Pretty much, right. yes. We have an amazing team on the ground. So we run dance programs, run drumming programs. We have a book publishing program. Aliyah runs her period poverty program um, in a, a social enterprise model mm -hmm. rather than a charity model. So we work together with people on the ground. I think that's the only way to really make it work, isn't it? Absolutely. Really. And the idea is about transforming global landscapes. Yep. So it's about transforming the lives of people here, starting with my kids, and equally the lives of people there. So we actually do it all together. It's brilliant. And you just recently won... Tell me what you've just recently won. Uh, so a few days ago, I did this pitch conference where mm -hmm. you go into a venue and you would pitch what your project is doing. And I did that and I came first place. So it was pretty cool. And so this is how you're raising money as well? The first step too, yep. Yeah. Very clever girl. <laughs> Thank you. Look, we wish you all the best, all of you. I hope you become a fabulous fashion designer. I hope you become the skateboard king of the world <laughs> and I hope you go on to have a career in communication of some description because <laughs> that's what I think you've got. Thank you. And Mum, how many more children would you like? None. Uh, <laughs> at the moment we have seven. <laughs> We're done. At the moment we have well, seven. Okay. Yes. And where will you be in a year's time, do you think? Is it who knows? In a year's time, oh, I'd like to think that we've had an opportunity to go back to Kenya, but if that doesn't happen, then so be it. You'll make the best of where we you are. We make the best of where we are. We have to go. Um, it's been great having your company. Uh, thanks for, for spending this half hour with us. We hope you've inspired you. So until next time we meet, keep yourself nice till then. And we're going to keep on chatting. <laughs>